Right, good afternoon everybody. What a lovely afternoon for not coming along to Sage at the Shawn and staying in in this horrible damp weather. So much better off in the warmth at Nicole home. is well known to most of you, or many of you. Uh, Nicole has actually been along to present to us before. Um, Nicole, who is a registered dietitian. Uh, I'm just gonna read out what we've got on our newsletter here as an introduction to her. It says, eating our way through all the Yom Tovim has made us return to all the traditional Jewish cuisine learned from our mothers, leaving us with the need to make New Year resolutions of connection. eating more healthily. Nicole has the answers mm -hmm. as she shares with us all her top tips Benefit. to lighten our food and adapt to a more controlled eating habit. So, Nicole, over to you. Thank you very much, Stuart. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, and I hope you'll find this talk interesting. My name's Nicole. I'm a dietitian. I actually Fred. specialize in paediatrics. You might like this. Um, but I don't uh, just do paediatric dietetics. I, I do other things as well. Um, just in case you don't know what a dietitian does, um, this is this gives you some idea. Um, my friends think I just eat healthily and exercise. Uh, society thinks people like me just spend our time talking to the media. My parents, well, my my patients and my fa and my father-in-law and my mother think I'm incredibly bossy. Um, but really what I'm trying to do is help them. And um, doctors think I run the catering department, which I don't. And um, I think I collaborate with my patients and I hope I do, but I also do quite a lot of calculations to find out how much people need when I'm sorting out a therapeutic diet for them. So that just gives you a little bit of background. Um, I want to go on to the next page, but I can't for some reason. Why can't I do that? Oh, here we go. Here's the next page. So some people think this is all I do is tell people that they're not eating the right way. And really what I just want to do is help people think about how they might be able to eat the foods they love to eat just a little bit more healthily. Um, and hopefully you can still enjoy all the things you normally enjoy, but in a way that's lighter and healthier. This is not opinion based, this is evidence based. There's a lot of stuff out there in the media, on the internet, that is opinion from people that aren't necessarily qualified, but this is all based on evidence. So I hope that helps you. So for some reason, it doesn't want to continue and I don't know why. Oh, here we go, all right. So I do, I'm just pressing a lot of buttons at the moment and hoping the right one makes it carry on. Um, so please bear with me if I can't always get my slides up immediately. So unfortunately, we know that there's a bit of an obesity epidemic out there. Um, turns out the chaps are rather worse than the ladies. Um, and we know that when we're overweight or obese, that it, it increases the risk of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, heart disease, stroke, and cancers of the esophagus, pancreas, the gut, um, all sorts of things that possibly we would all want to avoid. So of all the serious diseases going, type two diabetes, is the most strongly associated with obesity. So anything we can do to lighten our diet and make our, help ourselves to keep our weight stable or reduce a bit of weight can be helpful because the brilliant news is that 10% weight loss can reduce all these risks. If you want to find out what your BMI is, you can go on to this calculator that's on the NHS um, webpage to find out whether you've got a healthy BMI. So a healthy BMI is 20 to 25. If you're 
in your BMI is 25 to 30, you're categorized as overweight. If um, your BMI is above 30, you're considered obese. I mean, these are just clinical um, categorizations. Um, if you want to know where you are, it's very easy to just get onto the internet, look up NHS BMI calculator, and you'll be able to work out where your BMI is. We also know that actually weight, that your waist ratio, that your waist to hip ratio can also be an indicator of whether you've got high risk of heart disease. So for instance, if your waist is and if you're a chap and your waist is over, over 40 inches or 102 centimetres, then your risk of heart disease is likely to be higher than if it's less than that. Um, we know that people that are apple shaped, and that tends to be men in general, uh, tend to be at higher risk and uh, ladies generally are more pear-shaped and that's why risk for heart disease is actually lower in women, although some women are actually apple-shaped. So if you know, if you're like me and you carry all your weight on your bum and your thighs and your hips, it's a, uh, it, it's a sign that you're less likely to um, be at risk of heart disease, even if you do put on a little bit of extra weight. So how do we know how to eat healthily? Well, we've got this thing called the Eat Well Guide. And to be honest, the government have, since I've been a dietitian, this is the third iteration of the government uh, guidance for healthy eating. So um, we've got, when I started, it was the balance of good health, then it became the Eat Well Plate, and now it's the Eat Well Guide. And there are loads and loads and loads of fatty diets out there um, in the world. And I expect some people may have indulged in one or two. Um, and people often ask me, what is the best diet? And my answer is, it's the one you can stick to. Um, but this guide has been proven by all sorts of different uh, research endeavors um, it has been shown that this is the sense, most sensible way to maintain a healthy weight. And so what it tells us is that two thirds of our, what we eat should be vegetables and fruit. The other two thirds should be starchy foods. And the best types of starchy foods are the ones that are very high in fiber. Um, the, the remaining third should be made up of proteins from fish, meat, pulses, um, poultry, um, beans and lentils, nuts, and oils and spreads should make up a small slither of that. Now it says at the bottom in the in little orange, orange section at the bottom right hand corner, that ladies need 2000 calories a day and gentlemen need 2500 calories a day. That is really an average. And as we get older, we know that actually our calorie requirements are far less. And um, so those are a guide, but I would err on the side of being slightly less generous, certainly towards myself. Um, now I'm pushing 60 and I think for most people here, we would be looking at a, a lower number than that. It tells us that we need to eat, we need to reduce foods that are high in fats and sugars, and also foods that are high in salt. But in the top right hand corner, it tells us we need six to eight glasses of um, fluid every day. Um, now that's again, just an arbitrary figure. And in actual fact, some people may more, some people may need less. Um, and the best way to know whether you're properly hydrated is to look at the color of your pee. And if it's straw colored, then you know it's, um, you're well hydrated. Obviously some people may be on diuretics and that may, may 
actually encourage you to drink less, but it's actually important to carry on drinking fluids, even if you are on diuretics, unless you've been um, recommended to limit your fluid intake to a specific amount. Um, in the top left hand corner is a little label um, and that gives us an idea of the packaging uh, labelling that is out there and really what we're looking for is as much green as possible, uh, minimise the red the red blocks and um, occasionally it's okay to go for some of the amber colours. Um, but if we if we focus on the green, then we'll doing we'll be doing pretty well. Okay. Any questions so far? No. Okay. Moving on. So we we say that. With the Eat Well Guide, we're talking about five portions of fruit and vegetables a day. So what is a healthy portion, you might ask? And this, is, this graphic, this picture gives you some idea of what a healthy portion of fruit is. So we're looking to, to split our portions of fruit and vegetables, sort of, you know, three of veg, two of fruit in a day. But that's the minimum. You can eat more. Um, but we, we sort of recommend five uh, portions of fruit and veg a day as a minimum and many people aren't actually managing that yet. Um, one glass of fruit juice counts and that's it. Um, you can't eat five glasses of fruit juice and think you're hitting your recommended um, five a day I'm afraid. Um, again for vegetables we're talking three tablespoons of sort of small veg or three you know broccoli florets or three cauliflower florets um, or a, a bowl of a, a, a cereal bowl size of salad. For the starchy foods uh, we're recommending five portions of starchy foods a day and the sorts of things we're looking at is two to three heat tablespoons of cooked rice or pasta three to four tablespoons of cereals or one biscuit, you know, a Weetabix or a shredded wheat, um, half a bagel, a slice of bread or three egg sized potatoes. I really want to stress, unless you've got gut problems, it's really important to eat the, the higher fibre varieties because that actually keeps your gut moving. And very often as we get older, we sometimes have a tendency towards constipation. And the things that actually help your gut keep moving and keep your bowel healthy are high fibre cereals and fruits and veggies, also plenty of fluid and exercise as well. So keeping moving. And I'm not talking about having to go around, you know, um, pounding the streets of Bushy, as I know many of you do, but, you know, going for a, going for a walk every day can really help keep things keep things moving and keep your gut healthy. So as far as the protein foods are concerned, so we're talking about a very actually small size of uh, protein and I think once upon a time protein used to be considered a luxury and was almost a condiment. Um, but now it tends to be the hero of our plate when actually the fruits and veggies and the high fibre cereals should be. So for protein, like for a steak, we're talking just a, a something that's the size of a pack of cards. Um, and I know if we, you know, you go out for a meal at Aviv, you'll get something three times the size of that. So it's probably worth eating, eating half of it and taking the other half home in a goodie bag, maybe to heat up for, for next evening's meal. Or, you know, if there's two of you to share a steak between you. When we're talking about fish, we're talking about something, uh, a portion that's the size of a checkbook. I um, don't know whether people remember checkbooks, um, but I think uh, this audience does. And so we're talking a checkbook size for fish two eggs or four tablespoons of beans, lentils or chickpeas. And this is just background to help you get to a healthy choice when I, you know, we'll get on to the, um, 
to the traditional menu in a minute. So for dairy, dairy is incredibly important. So the fruits and vegetables provide lots of vitamins and minerals and fiber to keep you healthy and to keep your body processes and metabolism working properly. The, the starchy foods provide energy, stop us feeling tired and sleepy all the time, also provide fibre and also B vitamins, which are really important for the nervous system. Um, and then the dairy foods are really important for providing calcium. And calcium is really important for keeping our bones strong. And as we get older, um, our bone density starts to uh, reduce. And so eating dairy foods and taking vitamin D is really, really important. And the reason we have to take vitamin D is because it helps our body to absorb calcium. And I'm always banging on about vitamin D. And every time you hear me speak, I'll tell people that they've got to take their vitamin D supplements, particularly in the winter. Um, and we're talking about 10 micrograms of vitamin D. And if you're not taking it, go out or get online and order yourself some vitamin D to take because the only way we get vitamin D apart from a few foods in our diet, which generally we don't eat enough of to meet our requirements is from sunshine. And you only have to glance out the window to know that we're not gonna be seeing a lot of that for the next few months. So from September to March, we always recommend that people take a supplement of at least 10 micrograms of vitamin D, unless they've been told they need to take more by their doctor. So we, tend, we, we recommend three portions of dairy a day, and that can be either in the form of milk, that you add to your drinks or you know your hot drinks or you put on your cereal or you make your porridge with um, yogurt and cheese and I'll talk a bit more about yogurt a bit later on. As far as high fat and high sugar foods and drinks really there isn't a, there's no such thing as a healthy portion. Obviously they bring us a great deal of pleasure because they stimulate our pleasure uh, areas in our brain um, but it's always a good idea to keep, you know, to reduce them as much as possible and reserve them for a treat. As far as salt is concerned, now some people may already be on a restricted salt diet, but for the general population, we're talking six grams a day, which is under a teaspoon. It's not very much. Um, and a lot of that you'll find in manufactured foods, like for instance, bread, um, and breakfast cereals and things like that, which is why people say um, it's a good idea to limit processed foods. Uh, the main advice is to never add salt to your food at the table. And I know that's something that quite a lot of people do, um, particularly as they get older, because um, your, your taste buds become less sensitive but it's a good idea to try to limit your salt intake to the recommended six grams a day. So this is a beautiful Seder table um, and it's got the traditional things on it that you would expect on a Seder table. Um, we've just had all the ontus and now we're coming into winter it's very tempting to want to eat lots of hearty, stodgy, traditional Jewish food. So how do we do that and keep healthy? Well, let's start, let's go through a meal. So starting with chicken soup, which is pretty much everybody's favorite. It's Jewish penicillin. My father always used to say, this soup is a meal in itself. And actually it was because if you look at chicken soup with a couple of pieces of kreplach, a couple of canadles, a couple of, a, a, a slug of croutons. Now, I don't know about you, but I know kids love put it, putting croutons in their soup. And the old family joke is have some soup with your croutons um, and lotion. So if you add all that up, leaving aside the soup itself, you're looking at nearly 500 calories, which is 
pretty much what a meal would should would provide you and that's just the start that's just one of the starters so probably if you're going for a chicken soup choice maybe crepeloth or canadles all option but not the whole damn shooting match as my father-in-law would say going on to the chopped liver um now that amount of chopped liver on that cracker is around 50 calories um you can see a matzah cracker is a much better choice than a slice of challah because you're talking about a hundred more calories for the slice of challah so the other thing you can do to lighten your chopped liver is to add mix in a boiled egg rather than just using it as a garnish um, and that or a garnish as um, the uh, as as the, the boiled egg will reduce the amount of fat that you're eating when you go for your chopped liver starter. Main dishes, well, roast chicken and cholent are tend to be favourites. Um, and it's a good idea to chop the skin away if you can, um, because the skin provides 400 calories per 100 grams. Now, I know we only eat a very small amount of skin normally, but it's still, you could still save yourself 40 calories or so per serving just by not having the skin. And another 40 calories by choosing the light meat rather than the dark meat. If you're having cholent, maybe if you're making it yourself, put in, kuga, put in barley, or potato but not both and serve it with veg rather than kugel because you've already got you've already got your starchy food in there also if you want to eat, make it even lighter just make it a bean based one and leave the meat out um you know if you know the saying if in doubt leave it out um so those are some of the ideas to make your make your cholent just a little bit healthier your accompaniments, well, if you choose kugel, you're going for double the calories to boiled potatoes. And if I was give, having boiled potatoes, I would recommend eating them with the skins on if you can. If you um, are going for roasted potatoes, you're looking at an awful lot more calories. Um, 100 grams of roast potatoes is about 150 calories, um, whereas 100 grams of boiled potatoes is 70 calories, which is about half of that. So the other option is to go for potato wedges, where you can cut them up, put a bit of spray oil on them, and you've got the added benefit of the fibre as well. Um, and so they're a much healthier option for you. Now, vegetables on the whole, if you boil them or steam them, they're a healthy accompaniment. But simus is one of those very sweet uh, vegetable, uh, vegetable treats that we all love. Um, so if you really still want to have your simus, I would recommend making it with an artificial sweetener rather than with sugar or honey. Going on to dessert. Ah, oh, lakshan pudding. We all love a bit of lakshan pudding, but it's full of calories and fat. Lots of, lots of fat, lots of sugar, not very good for you. Occasionally as a treat, lovely, but a fruit salad or even a fruit crumble will give you fibre, vitamins, antioxidants, which help to keep your cells young and healthy and a lot fewer ca calories. Um, so that's how you can lighten your meal. What's interesting is there are actually quite a lot of very healthy kosher, um, traditionally Jewish foods, but there are some real horrors as well. Like for instance, cured meats, salt beef is delicious, but really limited if you can and the same with deli meats because we now know that the the um the nitrates that are used uh to make to preserve these and provide the red color for the um for the 
salt beef um, can be very damaging to the gut. Um, and the government and uh, cancer, uh, the World uh, Cancer Research Organization recommends that we try to eat as little cured meats as possible. And that includes things like sausages and salamis. Um, full fat cream cheese, absolutely delicious, got lots of fat in it, which is saturated like butter. And we know that saturated fats are not good for the heart. So again, if you can go for a lighter version of cream cheese, so much the better. The other thing I want to talk about really briefly is trans fats. Now in England, um, we've got legislation to prevent the use of trans fats and trans, uh, trans fats occur naturally in dairy and they're, they're okay, but it's the ones that come from hydrogenated fats um, that are really dangerous to the heart and you'll see on food labels if you look at ingredients you'll sometimes see hydrogenated palm oil or hydrogenated cottonseed oil particularly if they're kosher products from the states avoid 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 they are very 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 bad for you so for instance tell the chicken soup cubes have until recently, and I'm not sure whether they still do, hydrogenated fats in them. So go for a go for a stock cube like the muscle ones that don't use hydrogenated fats because they're much, much better for you. And it's very protective to your heart if you do that. Now there are some goodies and these are really traditional foods that seem to have fallen out of favour. Um, and are not so frequently eaten. Things like borscht, for instance. Now the beetroot in borscht, borscht is really, really good for you. It contains um, ingredients that actually help to lower the uh, blood pressure because they're, they're an, a nitrates that are naturally occurring, not ones that are added from curing, that reduce um, blood pressure by helping the blood wrestle, vessels to relax. Um, it is a temporary effect, but if you eat borscht regularly, then you'll um, reap the benefits. The only thing I would say is that there are some people that when they eat beetroot, it turns their pee red and it can give you one awful fright if that happens. So if you do eat beetroot and then the next day you see you're doing a bright red pea, don't worry, your kidneys aren't bleeding, it's just the pigment from the beetroot. If it carries on for a few days afterwards, then you can go to the GP. But if it's the next day or the day after, it's probably the beetroot. Um, now that bowl of soup in the middle is bean and barley soup. And that's another really, really lovely, healthy, hearty, traditional food. The barley and the beans both provide lots of fiber to keep your gut really healthy. It's also incredibly filling and incredibly nutritious, um, particularly if you don't chuck a load of salt into it. Um, next to the soup is something called labna. A labna is something that we used to sell absolutely shed loads of when I used to work in Big D in Preston Road when I was a teenager and you hardly see it anymore and the same with smetana which is a sour cream. Now sour cream is not so good for you because it's high in fat but things like yogurts are really really good for you because they, they have um, cultures in them that are of lactobacillus and these are, are, these are what we call the friendly bacteria. And those friendly bacteria should be living in your gut. But unfortunately, we have something that very frequently called dysbiosis, which means the healthy population of, of bacteria in our gut is disrupted by taking antibiotics and by um, certain chemicals um, in, you know, in our diets. 
So yogurts, particularly live yogurts, are really, really good for you for repopulating your gut with healthy bacteria. And the reason it's so important is because it's part of your immune system. And this is something that's only re in relatively recently been realized that actually our gut is not only is it our second brain, but it's also our second immune system. So if you can keep the bacteria in your gut really healthy with lots of lovely fermented foods like yogurt and sauerkraut, which is down below in the left-hand corner, then um, you'll be doing yourself, your whole body and particularly your gut a huge favor. Now the sauerkraut, you can get it commercially, but it's generally pasteurized and that unfortunately kills off most of the friendly bacteria. So it's really easy to make. And if you look on the internet, it's basically just cabbage and salt in a sterilized jar. So if you fancy, and it looks like they've added some caraway seeds and, and peppercorns in that one and caraway seeds make them absolutely delicious, make it absolutely delicious as well. Um, so if you want sauerkraut, try to find some that is not long life. Then of course, gefilte fish. Well, everybody knows the gefilte fish is the one that's swimming around with the carrot on its nose. And of course, gefilte fish traditionally was carp and carp is an oily freshwater fish. And we know that oily fish is really good for you. Carp isn't so popular these days and it's not so easy to get hold of. So my mum, and this is a very hot tip, when she made gefilte fish, she used to add either herring, get the fishmonger when he was mixing it, to add either mackerel or herring or a mixture of both to the white fish mixture. So you get your oily fish added in to your um, to your gefilte fish, which not only makes it much healthier and heart protective, but also makes it really, really delicious. And then in the bottom right hand corner, we've got herring. And Jews love herring and not a lot of other people do, I don't think. But herring again is an oily fish, really good for your heart. And actually pickled herring is good for you as well because it's fermented and, and things like schmaltz herring, they're fermented and um, fermented foods, as I say, are really, really good for your gut. So now we come to some general top tips for keeping our Jewish hearts healthy. For a start off, we need to reduce the amount of oil we're using. Um, but if we are going to use oil in our cooking, then the best choices are olive oil and rapeseed oil. Now, if you go into the supermarket and you look for rapeseed oil, it'll actually be more expensive than vegetable oil. But if you look at the vegetable oil, it's more than likely to be rapeseed oil if you actually look at the ingredients. Um, these contain monounsaturated fats, which help to reduce the bad cholesterol in our bloodstream um, and help to increase the good cholesterol, the LDL in our bloodstream, and that makes them protective to our heart. The reason I've got measuring spoons there is because if we are using oil, it's really a good idea to measure it out. I know chefs just kind of sprinkle it around liberally and particularly, you know, some of them really flamboyantly with one arm in the air like that, ole, I'm adding my olive oil. Great. But the more you add, the more calories you add because oil has fats have double the amount of calories per gram compared to carbohydrates and protein. So use them sparingly and use a measuring or use, use a normal spoon. It doesn't have to be a measuring spoon, but just don't slop it in the pan because you don't know how much you're putting in. Next to the spoons is a gravy separator. Now I've got one of these and I absolutely love it because when I've roasted a chicken, on, which I put on a, a grill so all the all the fat drains out into the juices. I then heat up the juices to make a gravy 
pour it into the into the gravy separator and you can see that the um, the spout is at the bottom bit so the oil rises to the top and you just get the lovely tasty um, juices out and you leave all the fat behind which is brilliant the other thing I would recommend is when you're cooking is to not fry um, or if you are frying to use a tiny tiny bit of oil or use one of those spray oils the light oils and instead grill on a rack or roast on a rack or, or bake or steam or boil or poach if you are eating meat and remember we're only going to have like a, a palm size or, or um, pack of card size of meat go for leaner cuts and any visible fat should be cut away also the other tip is that when you're making a meaty dish that might be with a fatty meat if you if you let it cool skim the fat off the top and then reheat it like this lady has done with her gravy rather than using a gravy separator that again reduces the amount of fat in your meal moving on from fats i've talked about increasing our fiber intake um, it's really important for helping to keep your heart and your gut healthy and the fiber we're getting is from pulses from whole grain breads from brown pastas brown rices um, things like barley and uh, quinoa is also good as well so if you can tolerate higher fiber choices do go for them it might make you a bit windy to start off with and a little bit bloated but if you're also getting plenty of um, healthy bacteria in your gut from your yogurt from probiotics that will help to alleviate that problem somewhat um, the other thing to protect your heart is to eat more fish and particularly oily fish going for things like tuna and salmon and mackerel and herring tuna is actually the least oily of the fish and uh, the oily fish and tin tuna is of no benefit at all but certainly salmon herring mackerel um pilchards they're all good oily fish sardines as well they're all good oily fish um the other thing that i was talking about is reducing the amount of salt in your diet and the best way to add flavour if you're binning the salt is to use lots and lots of herbs and spices things like ginger and turmeric chilies saffron um, uh, parsley rosemary basil um, dill all the sage all the thyme all these things add lots of wonderful flavours to your foods without necessarily adding extra salt If we are looking to control our weight, and not all of us will be, some people I can see joining us are you know, looking very fit and very slim and that's fantastic. But if you found, like I have to admit I have, that lockdown has meant a little bit more comfort eating and not quite so much exercise and a few more pounds have gone here, on here or there, this is the best way to actually at home without having to go on a fad diet, cut the calories and maybe lose one or two pounds. So for a start off, know your portion sizes. I've talked about the portion sizes um, and it's really important. And what can help you with keeping your portion sizes to the right amount so you don't eat too many calories is actually to choose a smaller plate and if researchers have found that people cut their intake calorie intake by over 20 percent just by choosing a smaller plate without compensating by eating more also you can if you start your meal with a glass of water that can help to alleviate hunger and in fact if you feel like a bit of a nosh quite often that's actually your body telling you you're, you need more fluid but because as we get older we don't feel our sensation of thirst so much 
um, it's actually a good idea to reach for a glass of water before you reach for a biscuit or a, or a chocolate or a piece of cake or some other nosh that you might fancy. And you might find that actually that desire to nosh goes. Also, it helps to fill you up before you start a meal if you know that you tend to eat bigger portions than you should. The other things that can help are eating, having a bowl of soup, because that fills you up, or salad as a starter. Now, some older people actually have much smaller, smaller appetites. And if that's you, then just ignore this, because if you don't have a big appetite and you're struggling to maintain your weight, this, this, this advice is not for you, okay? Also, if you're trying to lose weight, do what has been shown in this plate on the left-hand corner, which is go for loads of veggies. If you use a rule of thumb where you serve your veggies first and you fill half your plate with veggies and then split the remaining half with your carbs and your protein, then you're more likely to actually serve yourself a, 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 an appropriate portion of the higher energy foods. And if you can resist seconds, do. Okay. So to sum up, I just want to give you some words of wisdom from people who knew years and years ago before the advent of um, modern medicine, how important a healthy diet was. Hippocrates, who of course was a great pioneer of medicine as we know it, um, said, let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. Um, Socrates also agreed and said, you should eat to live, not live to eat. And then Altham Bion Savarin um, in the physiology of taste in 1825, so much more recently said, tell me what you eat and I will tell you mm. what you are. So those are my words of wisdom. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Nicole, th thank you so much for that. That's been so informative and has made my uh, taste buds uh, really jump to the fore there. But I was just sitting here and I was trying to work out how many calories in a really good Jewish Shabbos meal or Yontif meal when you start off with chopped liver with chicken soup with all the works, followed by chicken, chulant and um, kugel, followed by a nice portion of lochum pudding. And I didn't dare add up at the end, but uh, you can imagine the number of people that regularly sit down and have a meal like that and wonder why they've put on the pounds and get no exercise. So maybe it'll stop people seeing, but uh, I think, you know, some of the things and hints and tips that you've given people this afternoon well, aren't there for dramatically change a diet, but to, to help live a slightly healthier life without going hungry. I mean, some people think that you have to starve yourself to go on diet, these fad diets that people lose Not a lot of weight on and then put it back on in a few months later. Uh, Not at all. This, I, I mean, this is, this is about sustainable change. Yeah. So I think the message is, you know, you can carry on living a good lifestyle, but... Uh, you can eat healthily and still enjoy your eating and, and get plenty of it. So Indeed. thank you so much for that. Right. Pleasure. Anybody got some questions? If you want to take off your sharing screen now, Nicole, please. Nicole, it's Daphne. Hello, Daphne. Hello. Um, every time you hear advice, you hear different things. I went to a pre-diabetic pre -diabetic course. And at that, day, that time, I said they were turning everything that I'd learned upside down. I'm talking about a few years ago. And now you're saying very different things to me about the five carbs, five carbs. Yeah. And low fat yogurt. They no. were saying nothing low fat, everything high fat. I no. thought I would go to heaven because I could have everything, all the high fat stuff. And now you're saying very different things to me. Well, so... If you have a health condition, you and you've been um, advised about your health condition, 
then you have to take that advice. This is general healthy eating advice if you don't have a specific health condition. If you're under the care of any other sort of clinician who has given you dietary advice for a specific condition, then that's the advice that you should take. Yeah, because it was a whole, it was a, it was a course, like a six week course or something, pre-diabetic. Loads of people have gone on it, loads of people. But anyway, yeah. thank you. <laughs> I, I like your diet better than their diet anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I like your healthy eating better than theirs. Okay, thank you. Nicole, I, I do know people that have been type 2 diabetics uh, because they've been overweight largely. And I've gone on diet, lost weight, and the diabetes has gone away. So, you know, it is an important message. Oh, people. absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, when I first started practicing, diabetes was considered a disease that was only progressive. Now we know that you can put diabetes into, into remission through diet and exercise. But it is one of those diseases that is remitting and relapsing. So if you stop the diet and exercise that made your, um, that put your diabetes into remission, then it will relapse. You will go back into pre-diabetes and perhaps diabetes if you then liberalize your diet and stop exercising. But, you know, I, I tend to think we should all think of ourselves as if we were dogs. We need to exercise regularly. You would not have a dog and not take your dog out for a walk every day. And we need to do exactly the same thing. We need to get out there. We need to keep ourselves moving, not just because it, it is good for our hearts. It's good for our joints. It's good for our bowels. It's, it's good for our weight. It's just, it's good for every, it's good for our brains. It makes you, particularly if you go out, you know, it, it enhances your mood. I mean, I, I, I run and I looked out of the window this morning and I thought, on Tuesday is my run day. And I thought, oh no. And I got my waterproof on and I mean, it took me three quarters of an hour to psych myself up to do it. But I went and I had the most fantastic, exhilarating, wonderful run, even though it was pouring with rain and I came back soaking wet. And I had a lovely hot shower afterwards. And I'm not telling everybody they've got to go running, <laughs> but there is no such thing as the wrong weather. It's the wrong clothes. And in, in fact, in, in countries, in Scandinavian countries, where the weather is far worse than it is here, they don't say there's the wrong weather, it's the wrong weather. They say it's the wrong, you're wearing the wrong clothes. You know, Nicole, it, yeah. can, can, I, can I ask a question? Can mm -hmm. I ask you, you've not mentioned bananas and nuts. Can mm -hmm. you sort of say how much is one should have of bananas and nuts in a day? Okay. So a, a banana is fine. Uh, bananas are lovely. They, they, they're actually prebiotic. So they feed the good bacteria in your gut. Um, and they've got, they're a good source of potassium, which is, you know, good for your heart as well and your blood pressure. Um, so yeah, unless, unless you've been told because you've got poor, con, you know, blood sugar control that you can't eat bananas, um, and that, you know, that tends to be, you know, a bit of a myth. Um, go right ahead and eat a banana. Now, if you want to actually reduce the speed at which your banana, the sugar in your banana is absorbed into your bloodstream, have it with some yogurt. And the combination of the protein uh, from the yogurt will slow down the absorption of the sugar into your bloodstream from the banana. And if you go for a low fat yogurt, then you're not, you know, adding any anything in terms of significant calories. But I would go for a plain yogurt, stick, add it to your banana and your banana's providing the fruit, the, the sweetness that a fruit you'd get from a fruit flavor yogurt. Um, as far as nuts are concerned, nuts are a great source of healthy fats and protein and fiber. Um, and I don't see that there's any harm in eating 
what we would consider to be a small portion of nuts, which is about 20 almonds, something like that. Um, and, you know, if you are going to eat nuts, then what I would do is put like a little portion of nuts into a little ramekin and take them away and eat them and put the rest of the packet back in the cupboard because nuts are very tasty and they are very Moorish. So you just put your portion that you're going to eat for the day, which is about a tablespoon, into your little ramekin and sit down and eat it and put the rest of them in the cupboard for the next day. Nicole, Thank you very much. based on what you're saying, everybody should get a Jewish dog. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask a question? Yes, carry on. Carry on. It's, it's Marion Ottenbach here. Hello. Um, you, you mentioned about people who are struggling to maintain their weight. I'm very underweight. I'm in an awful lot of pain. Um, when I'm in pain, I actually can't eat. How can I put weight on? I am really trying very hard to maintain my weight. Have you, have you seen problem, a dietitian, Marion? Sorry, I can't hear you. Have you seen a dietitian? I haven't, no. Right, well, I suggest, I mean, I can, I can tell you what you need to do, but I, it's not really yes, right for yes. me to do a personal oh, consultation yeah, yeah. here. Yeah. But I would suggest you go to see your GP or you phone your GP and you say, I am struggling to maintain my weight and I'm in a lot of pain and I need some dietary advice. Please, can you refer me to a dietitian? And a dietitian will be able to help you, give you the advice that you need to, I mean, I'm doing it at the moment with my father-in-law who lives with me. Um, he, you know, we need to make sure that he maintains his weight. And uh, it's very easy to do. There are some very simple fixes that you can do to help you to, to ma maintain and gain weight. Um, but you do need to be seen by a dietitian to keep you personalised. Is that something that you could do for me, is it, if we had a chat? Yes, if, if I came to see yes, you. Yes, okay. yes, we can do you. that. I'll do that, thank you. Okay, other okay. people? Oh, yes, but that's the question. Hi, Nicole. You oh. mentioned, <clears throat> hi, the people are talking about this 5-2 diet. I just want to know your opinion on that. And if one does go on it, you know, how long should it be for? Okay. So um, I've actually tried the 5-2 diet. I try most diets just to see what, what they're like, um, because that's, <laughs> that's the only way you know, you know what it's going to be like to be on these diets. And I do have a tendency to gain weight anyway, so it helps me when I've put on a few pounds to slip back into a weight that I'm more comfortable with. To be honest, I absolutely hated the 5-2 diet, but some people swear by it. And in fact, when it first came out, um, quite where, where I was working, quite a number of us in the department tried it, and some people thought it was fantastic. Um, I found it absolutely exhausting the days where you were only allowed to eat six or eight hundred calories i could barely get through the day but that's just me we're all different and some people found they you know they had more energy um the other the other thing that i found was the problem was that i just overcompensated on the days <laughs> when i could eat you know what i wanted to eat because i felt so yeah. deprived and so exhausted from the two days where i hadn't eaten very much at all but other people find that it's a really helpful way of losing weight yes, it um, seems to work for my daughter-in-law and i'm just wondering if i should try it because yeah. as you said i put on so much weight you know noshing during lockdown unfortunately yeah I know. I mean, I, the only way you'll know is if you give it a go and yeah. you see if it suits you. Um, you know, it's not, it's not the worst start in the world. You know, I've seen a lot worse. If you were to say, I want to try the cabbage diet, I would say, no, don't go there. Um, but, you know, there, there are worse starts than the 5-2 diet. And if you think it will help you, give it a go and see if it suits you. But as, going back to what I said at the very beginning, the best diet obviously excluding all the mad extreme fad diets. Um, the best diet is the one that you can stick to. Sure. Thank you very much. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, I'd like, like to ask Nicole, what do you think of, 
bought probiotics capsule forms? Yeah, Aren't I think, think they can be very were... helpful. Um, there are some very reputable brands out there. And I would go into your local health food shop if you've got one and, and go and ask their advice. Um, I did that just recently, actually, because I was struggling um, with a bit of discomfort and pain. And it can be very good for helping to sort of calm things down, particularly if you get a lot of bloating. Mm -hmm. um, and the lady at the shop was really, really helpful because I'm not an expert about everything. And um, we had a chat about it and she recommended something. And actually I found it very, very helpful. But you have to go for, a, you know, you have to go for a, a, a brand that um, is a reputable. Um, the only thing, and it has got a, a, a resistant coating for, because um, it's got a sort of, the capsule's got to make it past the acidic environment of the stomach into the low gut to be um, effective. Right. Okay. Thank you. Nicole, have you got time for one or two more questions? Yeah, I'm, I've got time if you've got time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can Anybody else? Can I, can I just say something? Hilary Perry. Hello, Hilary. How are you? Hello, Nicole. I'm fine, thank you. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. Uh, I know that I've been eating all the wrong things at the wrong times, <laughs> but it was a very interesting talk. And I just wanted to say the Sharons send their love. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I miss them. Nicole, the one much. thing you haven't mentioned is um, uh, noshing between meals. Yeah which for me as a big nosher is a problem. What yeah. do you suggest about that? Yeah. Okay. So um, <laughs> I, I could say take up knitting actually, because I'm <laughs> knitting. Knitting. I think that would suit Howard. Yes. <laughs> that would <laughs> really too. help me stop noshing. Um, one of the things that I think is a really good idea is to, for a start off, go for a drink first and I'm not talking about down the pub I'm talking about um have a you know have a glass of water or or, or a, a coffee or a tea just to check that it, you're not dehydrated because very often we are and we just don't realize it and that's why we want something to eat the other thing I would do is every day cut up some um veggies and fruits and have them ready in a Tupperware in the fridge. Because if you have sticks of carrot and cucumber and, and peppers and, and um, whatever you like, sort of cauliflower florets and, and button mushrooms and all sorts of things that you can just grab and grapes and satsumas and cut up mm -hmm. apple and pear. And if, you're, if you go for things like that, you're much more likely to not suffer the adverse consequences of not <laughs> doesn't beat that doesn't beat cabra's dairy milk does it well <laughs> the other thing is sometimes if you want a really really big sweet hit that isn't actually going to lead to you eating a whole packet of biscuits or a whole bar of chocolate is have some figs dried figs or dried dates, you know, make jewel dates or um, dried apricots, mm. because actually those are really sweet, but they'll give you a bit more, a bit more fiber. Mm. And they usually do the trick for me if I've got like a desperate need for something sweet. Mm. And, you, you know, just a couple of figs or a couple of medjool dates pe pack such a huge sweet punch mm. that you'll probably find you don't need anything else. Mm. Um, <coughs> if you are going to go for chocolate. Oh, Benji. The 75, 70% 70 cocoa is a better choice than your old Cadbury's dairy milk. Um, oh. much, it's much better for you and it's all you're also a lot you're less likely to eat so much of it because it's not so it's sweet it's not so high in fat but it's so much more um powerfully chocolatey 
it can also, a smaller amount can usually sort your cravings out if you've got them. But often it's some water that will sort that out more than anything else. But I just ask one thing. I, um, if I, a very quick question. Um, I actually went on the pre-diabetic um, course, probably similar to Daphne. I actually found it very helpful. One thing they mentioned though, I find watching television, I can't have another cup of tea late in the evening. And I found grapes very good because they're thirst quenching. But she did warn me I mustn't have too many of them. And I wondered what you thought about them because you've put that as an idea in the fridge with the cut up other things for a little bit of a nosh. What's your thought about grapes? Because that's the hardest thing for me not to eat. Actually, top tip, stick them in the freezer and you'll eat a lot ah. fewer of them. Good idea. And, and thank you. And um, I mean, grapes are, are, are fine as a snack, but you can eat too many of them and they will have an impact on your blood sugars because they are very Moorish. But if you stick them on the free in your, the freezer, it takes a lot longer to get through them. <laughs> and um, oh, it's good that, idea. Um, the other thing just to mention um, that um, about bananas is if you stick bananas in the freezer and then whiz them up, um, you get really nice banana ice cream. Oh. <laughs> Nikki, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, cool. Thank you. Can Thank you. Can I ask you, have you heard of Yuckle? Yes, I have. Because I was told by my, my daughter-in-law to take it, that it would help me. Is it okay to take? Yakult is is a probiotic like Actimel. They they are they are researched, so they are reputable. And in fact, when um, I was working at Northwick Park Hospital, a research paper was done actually on Actimel, and the research paper showed that it helped to prevent people from developing. Um, C. diff when they were in a hospital if they were on antibiotics and so the guests, oh, thank the, you. The, the, yeah. the physicians started to actually put on the drug charts Actimel and then we'd get a phone call from from the um, from the nurses saying the doctors prescribed Act Actimel how do I get hold of it and um, Actually, that wasn't part of our job. So we just used to say, tell members of the family to buy some from the supermarket and bring it in. But they, both Yakult and Actimel are very good for um, <coughs> as probiotic drinks. Yes, because it, it comes from Yorkshire. I get some from Yorkshire through my daughter-in-law and it's apparently good for cystitis and things like that as well, which yeah. I say, yeah, oh, well, that's okay. I, that's okay. Yeah. Okay, I think one more question for Nicole. Yeah. And then Can you we'll tell us it. about soft drinks, carbonated drinks, and light drinks? And also, after that, can you tell us about the calorie contents of alcoholic drinks? <laughs> okay, so um, soft drinks are actually, I, I mean, I would just ban them if I could. <laughs> <laughs> but they they really are of no benefit but my eldest son drinks gallons of them and he's very cross that the government has put in legislation to reduce the amount of sugar in soft drinks so the government created a sugar tax it's to reduce the amount of sugar that was added to soft drinks so now what they do is they add sweetener as well as sugar um, and it has reduced the amount of calories in them. And it's also reduced, um, it has had a really beneficial effect globally on the amount of calories people are consuming from soft drinks. Um, 
Some people say diet drinks are less good for you because of the artificial sweeteners. And the trouble is, is that the artificial sweeteners can muck about with your, the healthy gut and your bacteria. And the trouble is, is that quite a lot of people say things like I'm addicted to dark coke and they drink lots and lots and lots of dark coke and that's why and they think they're not doing themselves any harm and they may not be but equally they may be it's very individual um and I would always recommend that if you want to drink fizzy drinks then again you you limit, you limit it, you know, everything in moderation. I'm not suggesting you don't drink them at all. Um, but occasionally, maybe, you know, once a day with a meal rather than every single time you want a drink, you go for a fizzy drink um, because that's not really that beneficial. And, you know, other beverages like, well, water, obviously milk. Milk is a very good beverage. Milk is, uh, milk is actually recommended as a drink for fast recovery after exercise. And, you know, low fat milks, um, lower fat milks are, are, are absolutely fine for you. Um, and they contribute to your calcium intake. Um, as far as alcohol is concerned, alcohol uh, gives a lot of pe people a great deal of pleasure, um, but alcohol does contain quite a lot of calories. Um, and if you joined any slimming group, you would know that actually alcohol is one of the areas that affects most people's um, ability to lose weight because they see alcohol consumption as something that is very pleasurable, very social and something they find very hard to give up. And actually it's for many people it makes a huge difference to their actual to their to the level of success that they achieve with weight loss so again you know there are some there are some alcoholic drinks that are lower in calories than others um apparently uh rum is a lower calorie choice um, and a very popular in slimming groups, Brum and Diet Coke, I believe. Um, also, um, you know, I mean, all, all, all alcoholic drinks provide an awful lot of calories and no nutrition really whatsoever. Um, so again, I would, I would recommend you limit them and certainly don't have more than the recommended amount that the government, the 14 units that the government recommends, which is, two you know two units a day and a couple of alcohol free days really is the best advice um i can give or no alcohol at all if you're not that bothered about it or very occasionally a glass of red wine um if you are a fan of alcohol then red wine has the most benefits um but if you know people say you know there are there are always studies that come out that say oh you know red wine has has this benefit and that benefit but the the caveat is always but don't start drinking if you're not a drinker you know just because there are benefits to red wine if you're not a drinker it doesn't mean you've got to start drinking it <laughs> thank you there you are there you are cyril now you know <laughs> yes, right okay yeah. nicole ask? thank you thank you so much for an in, not only interesting but informative talk and i'm sure there's some lessons learned to take away if you're going to go out walking tomorrow and it's raining and you're going to dress up in your sou'westers or your oil skins, just be aware of the loose leaves that are lying about as well. Yes, we don't yes. really it's very slippery over underfoot. The, only th the one thing I would say, Stuart, is if I'm, I'm really happy to do these talks. So if there are particular subjects that people want to know about and they let you know, then I'll, ha I'll happily come back. Lovely. If you want. We, we will take you up on that and you know please keep us informed all out all you people out there mm -hmm. i've asked you to in terms of desert island discs today please in terms of ask the rabbi for our session on the 10th of november we've had 80 of you joining in today there must be people out there who would love to contribute towards desert island discs many of you have got questions you'd love to ask our two rabbis so please do that and if there is particular subjects that you feel in terms of diet 
and, and food related issues, please again let us know and we can ask Nicole to come back, please God, early in the new year. Uh, next Thank Tuesday, you. Thank you. Next Thank Tuesday you. we have Dan Fox and Louis Trupp who will be talking to us about Jews in the British Armed Forces since 1745. And can I remind you again, again by uh, popular demand, we will be starting to, uh, Thursday the 3rd of November on our first effort at current affairs and that will run for every Thursday again during November. So thank you everybody for joining in this afternoon. Thank yes. you Nicole yes. once again uh, and good afternoon. If you want to stay and chat, please feel free to do so. Ta-ra.